Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to episode 62 of the Cloudcast. We're coming to you live from our massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it has been almost a year. Wow, has it really been that long since we took a deep dive into OpenStack. Um, Tonight, we're lucky enough to have a guest that's been involved in this project since the very, very beginning. So welcome to Jesse Andrews. Hello, Jesse. How are you doing tonight? Doing pretty great. Um, Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Show. And and so, for those that aren't familiar with you and your background, give give us a little background on yourself. Sure, um, I had the good fortune to join a bunch of folks uh, that were working on our project um, to build really more of a platform as a service offering at NASA. Um, just because, just like many other large organizations, they have lots of different projects, and each of them have their own websites and so on and so forth, and so. What, but as we tried to build a platform to solve those needs, um, we actually ran into the more fundamental problem, which uh, a lot of people in industry face, which is getting those bare infrastructure requirements, the storage, the compute, was actually a large problem and involved us waiting multiple months to get a single VM instance. And so we started down the path working on various open source um, infrastructure projects. And what we realized along the way is that we needed to take a slightly different approach than what um, several of the other projects have been doing. We needed to take an approach which is more of a cloud framework um, that allowed deployers to integrate with their specific uh, requirements and their specific IT systems. Um, And so we we went and created a project called Nova, which was open sourced and uh, eventually joined up with the Raxpost guys who open sourced their object storage system called Swift. And that became the basis of OpenStack. Okay, and and you were doing that as something that was sort of outside. I mean, it was for for NASA at the time, but it was for a a group that was called Anso Labs or ANSO yes. Labs at the time, right? Okay. Yeah. So Anso Labs was a company I co-founded uh, <clears throat> to to do this work for NASA to work on open data and open government uh, um, and open source projects. Um, and and originally we were working on a different open source project um, that. It was really trying to solve different needs than what we had. And so that project continues to exist and continues to uh, solve certain people's needs. Um, and so part of my naivety, uh, the fact that I really didn't come from a uh, government contracting background. I, I worked in um, open source and I worked in the startup ecosystem. I'd been at multiple, like the previously I'd been at a, a, um, a project called Flock, a company called Flock that was based on Mozilla, uh, an open source web browser. Oh yeah, um, and so I was I was used to doing open source and cl- uh, and building commercial things on top of it. And so uh, I had started this company called Anso to try to do similar things uh, in this role that we had found that the government was wanting. And so my not knowing how the government really works, when I heard that they needed us to scale up, I hired some people <laughs> and. Turns out that there's this thing called red tape, and uh, between the time that I told guys to quit their job and join me, and they were actually on NASA payroll was multiple months. And so uh, this guy named Vish, who's actually maintains like uh, a really strong uh, development leadership of the Nova project, had just driven out from Iowa. He shows up Friday, uh, 6 p.m. in San Francisco. And I'm like, well, I don't really, you have your job, but you can't go to NASA yet. So let's start working on this. Uh, let's rewrite this project uh, and do it in Python in the weekend. And it, it just grew from there. Wow. That's, that's crazy. I mean, it, you know, the other thing that, that's sort of interesting. So, so now um, you're, at, you're at Nebula, your company called Nebula, startup uh, that's, that's OpenStack focused, your director of technology there. You know, it's sort of interesting to hear the early stories about about OpenStack and what Anso was doing and what NASA was doing, and because you hear, you, you know, you hear folks like Chris Kemp, who's now the CEO at Nebula, you hear um, uh, uh, McGinty over at uh, at Piston Cloud, you hear a number of people who sort of talk about being the the founder or the father. You know, Rick Clark was involved with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, way back when you guys were getting started on this, not to try and rewrite history. I mean, really, was it just a bunch of people who kind of had this common, um, you know, passion for open source and you just had a problem that, that 
you know, you were trying to solve it was just how do you get an environment to run uh, easier to set up? Or, I mean, was there really, was there ever kind of any thought about like, hey, this is, we're really doing something that's really new and unique? Or was it just a, at the time, just smart people in a, in a big project? Um, I think it's a little bit of everything. I mean, um, the, uh, Josh McKinty, um, uh, Raymond O'Brien, um, uh, Chris Kemp, all these guys, we wouldn't have done it wouldn't have been possible to do what we could have what happened without them. Um, I didn't have the vision to go into NASA and uh, create the ne- uh, NASA Nebula project or anything like that. That that was work that had been done prior to that uh, to me being involved. Um, so the the thing that I added was bringing deciding that the existing open source projects we couldn't just continue to hit the brick wall of trying to. Um, change them to be something they weren't and that there was something fundamentally different about what we needed that we needed something where it was really flexible and the integration points were um, w- were there for vastly different storage and vastly different um, uh, 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 like identity systems gotcha. and so um, OpenStack wouldn't have happened if you didn't have the people try- working on open government all the way up to Vivek Kundra um, and if you didn't have technologists, uh, Josh McKinty, myself, and my team, uh, along with the people at Rackspace who had the vision that you know it, it, you can't compete solely on technology, you need to compete on the services that you're uh, the, the support and services and other sorts of um, uh, ways of di- divi- uh, dividing up the market. Gotcha. gotcha. And, and did did anyone ever <clears throat> think it was going to get this big? When you, when you were just, like you were saying, when you started out just a project for a weekend kind of thing, did anyone ever think it was going to grow to what it is today? Well, we, we, we internally, just like this, there was, um, there was about six of us at the very beginning. Um, and and it, some of the people weren't even on the company uh, originally, and they just wanted to work on the project. Um, and we were joking that it would be awesome because at the time, Eucalyptus was uh, part of, or potentially part of, Canonical's uh, Ubuntu OS, and we were thinking it would be awesome if we were able to be there as well. And so at the Essex Design Summit, when the CEO of Canonical gave a demo and uh, said that every uh, Ubuntu deploy can now be an OpenStack cloud, was just like that was an amazing realization. And just seeing the like the work that's going on in in the broader ecosystem that that's you know we're helping push forward. Um, like I think there's a healthy competition right now between Eucalyptus, uh, CloudStack, and OpenStack, and I think that uh, it's it's nice to be part of that and be able to see you know the, the great work that um, you know CloudStack is doing in, in the for instance there everybody loves the work that went into their new control panel and it's always been a strong point and I think having different open source options really pushes the entire ecosystem forward. Very cool. Very cool. So. Um... So uh, you've you've had a, a, a lot of interesting roles. Uh, you sort of wear a number of hats. One of the ones that you that you wear currently is you're part of the OpenStack board of directors. Um, can you talk a little bit? So you know, OpenStack has obviously gone through some some evolution. I mean, it started off as sort of a a joint rack space NASA thing. Uh, over the last year plus, it's it's moved out of kind of being you know very heavily. Um, driven by Rackspace, and now it's being driven by this thing called the OpenStack Foundation. Can you, you know, from, from the viewpoint that you sit, the involvement that you have, can you talk a little bit about, you know, not only what's going on with the foundation, but, you know, where is uh, OpenStack in terms of Folsom, the, the maturity of the overall technology today? Sure. Um, well, we just finished up the largest design summit ever, which um, had over 1,200 users and developers showing up for a full week to um, learn about what we did in Folsom and to plan what we're going to do next. And that was, I think, over, I think, 200, uh, maybe 240 different sessions uh, for an entire week. Um, The Folsom release occurred at the end of September, um, uh, and there are multiple distros and products that already have the Folsom release included. Um, And what's nice is we have uh, some some news from popular Linux distributions like uh, the Apple EPL, Pell um, support of, of OpenStack for uh, Red Hat, and also Canonical announced that they'll support through the Cloud Archive um, 
new Folsom and newer versions of OpenStack in Ubuntu LTS. Um, so that that's really great news for people who want to consume OpenStack but have a favorite OS. And there are other OS vendors um, who are getting more and more involved, such as in the Folsom release, um, people around Hyper-V have really stepped up, including Microsoft, to make sure that there's solid support and they're continuing to work on pushing forward uh, integration there. Um, the thing I thought that was really the coolest about the uh, summit, though, is that you know, this is a, a grueling thing because there's, you know, it's a full week, and um, while there is a, com- uh, a conference side, which is presentations um, and kind of like it, it's one person talking to an entire room, um, most of the sessions are more um, collaborative where you have 20 to 100 people in a room uh, t- discussing a problem that exists and how to make it better. And at the end of that week, you know, going for hour after hour every single day, um, we still had over 40 people from many, many companies that got together. And we actually had a constructive conversation about, you know, subtle refinements to our release process um, that, that actually happened. And I thought that was a real sign of the maturity of the fact that this is really a large amount of uh, companies who are collaborating on releasing software. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting. I, I I haven't had a chance to be out to the last couple of summits. I went to the one uh, a year ago or so, the one that was in Santa Clara, and it was it was kind of fascinating to me because because like you said, not only did you have these these sessions where people, you know, you had a few folks sort of driving the session, but then you had a a handful of people who were literally like writing code um, or hacking on things as things went along, and it it felt like a little bit of chaos, but you but you definitely could tell there were. There were enough people, a handful of people, or at least a couple of leads for projects that were sort of steering it. People sort of knew where to go to ask questions. And, you know, if, if what you're saying now is it's, it's evolved to a point where, you know, you're having these, these, these more robust kind of conversations. You're talking about things that, you know, aren't just features. They're releases. They're how do you get them into mainstream OSs. Um, that, that's, you you got to look at that as a, as a pretty good, you know, next step in terms of maturity, I would think. Yeah, and we have both. I mean, there's. I'm not saying there's no crazy. I mean, there's. There are people pushing <laughs> this uh, project. I mean, being more of a, uh, you know, there's not a open stack you could just download and expect it to work. It, it is subtly different than what Eucalyptus and CloudStack is trying to do. Um, each of there's many many distros that um, decide how you put it together and what sort of things you do. And so people will come and talk about. You know, th- there's people running these crazy advanced ARM processors with hundreds or thousands of cores and doing things that are so outside of the mainstream but may be mainstream in a few years. And uh, so, so there's certainly you know, things all over the map happening. Um, and th- also going into this, I t- talk more about the foundation. Um, you know, going from Rackspace, who I think was a pretty good leader uh, of the project, um, they, they they did a lot to um, not show any partiality. They didn't even do their own distribution or product offering really until the foundation was uh, announced that it was going to be uh, to, to going to occur. And then um, so that way people didn't you know assume or even think that uh, that that Rackspace is trying to co-opt it all. Yeah. Um, so they, they, there was a very open uh, transition. You know, there's always you know potential ways to do it better. You know, with you know just going back to the design summit, the size that it is growing at is so fast that you, looking back, there's always something where you can say we could do that a little better. But um, it it's went really uh, well for the 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 amount of growth and the amount of change that's occurred. Um, we've had. Um, multiple new gold members, which are we have different tiers of support for the foundation. Um, VMware, NEC, and Innovance, uh, who recently joined, and um, they joined not to say they are going to be making con- contributions. Um, they have been making contributions the entire time. Um, and, and you know, as my personal view, as as an uh, individual director of OpenStack, the most important thing we have to work through, and this is where where I challenge the foundation to work on, is. Um, sort of refining this definition of what OpenStack is and isn't, um, because just because you know, we're doing so much, we're so it's since because it's a framework, um, but by defining us to being more like the kernel of an OS, you know, the, the Linux, we're trying to be like the Linux kernel, not the entire Linux distro, and what that means is we're trying to be the core of a cloud rather than 
you know, being load balancing and database as a service and going on and on and up the chain. Um, and that, that's my view of what OpenStack we really need to do because then we could empower an entire ecosystem to grow and support those things. And it may be that just as Linux distros choose certain projects that are just always included and we have the equivalent of like a OpenStack standards base like LSB for Linux, uh, we may, you know, everybody may assume that in order to have an OpenStack cloud, of course you deploy a database as a service. But rather than having to have that being made by, uh, those decisions be made by a foundation, let's let market dynamics decide what the entire stack of a cloud looks like. Yeah. And, and so, Jesse, from talking about the Folsom release a little bit more too, what are some of the big differentiators of Folsom over Essex that, that some of the people are talking about or that are really generating interest? Sure. Um, the there was a this is actually an integration release. Uh, work was done in SOT and uh, changing the way interfaces are exposed internally. Um, two of the biggest ones are um, we had created Nova at NASA to basically each subdirectory in the original Nova tree was basically a different service or a different component, and one of the first things that uh, broke out was identity because we needed to share, share identity and authentication and authorization between um, the various projects. But certain things like Nova, um, as of a year ago, also had volumes, which is uh, the equivalent of like um, uh, EBS, um, and it also uh, did network configuration, and so uh, and it supported various modes, but it wasn't quite uh, what everybody's definition of SDN or virtual networking was. So a lot of work went into just refining the projects overall, and that was the Quantum Project is now led by um, uh, an awesome guy named Dan Isira, who um, is really exposing uh, network virtualization to both Quantum and, I'm uh, sorry, to both you know, compute Nova, as well as being something that you could plug bare metal into or something. And then also we had the and, and there's lots of work that went in quantum with lots of different network vendors uh, products being able to be controlled through the quantum interfaces. Um, and continuing on that line, the volume, Nova volumes got extracted and became something called Cinder, the Cinder block service. Um, and uh, it's had lots of participation again from vendors and from cloud deployers and um, uh, adding support for other. Hardware, um, hardware uh, appliances, um, SANs and NASs, uh, as well as um, uh, improving APIs for things like snapshotting and whatnot. Okay, so yeah, so I I, I think what you're you know it, it's it's probably sort of a typical evolution. I mean, you went from sort of one big blob, uh, that's the wrong word, but but Nova contains sort of everything to where you have these distinct kind of services and and you know you're. I would guess as you move along, like quantum was was driven a lot. I mean, granted, it was it was a number of teams, but I mean, folks like Nasira at the time were driving it. They've got <laughs> network expertise. I would think, you know, in some of the new, new storage projects, you're going to have people that kind of come with some of that background. I mean, are you seeing that as the the projects start to sort of uh, either expand or become distinct that you're finding expertise from those types of areas, whether it's like security or networking, or is it a lot of the same core people, they're just able to, to move their focus? Um, actually, it's, it's we originally, um, when we started by uh, with the, the going back all the way to Keystone, which is our identity service that we abstracted out, um, that was pretty much the same people. And this was back in Diablo release. That was, uh, I guess it was the three before... So almost two years ago now. Um, and so in that release, it was a lot of the same guys. Like uh, I, I um, uh, pinged some of the guys that, uh, that I was working with. I wasn't at Nebula at the time, but I pinged them, and I pinged the guys at Piston, and I pinged you know, all the people that we knew that had been contributing solidly to Nova and to Glance because we needed to have a, gen a, a single unified login because at the time... Swift had its own user accounts, and Nova had its own user accounts just because of the heredity of the projects. Um, but what we've seen is as new companies have come in, um, Red Hat being one of the first um, who they came in and really contributed to the identity uh, uh, system because they, they have people who work on open source identity systems. And um, 
with Quantum and Cinder, where they've happened in the last you know six to twelve months, uh, we had that where there was experts coming in. But what's great is the the people um, you know uh, the, the Cinder project is led by uh, a guy who actually works at Solid Fire and um, which is another of the uh, the hardware appliances for storage. Yep. And so they're working with the people who um, know about the generalized orchestration and op- OpenStack things. And so, um, but we have a lot of experts coming in and, and telling us, you know, where we could do better and how we could increase the layers of abstraction. And so it's been a great sort of uh, evolution that's occurred in the entire ecosystem as we have now both generalists and deep experts in all these different areas. And Jesse, is that something that will continue through? Um, and for those of the, that don't know, Grizzly is the, is the code name for the next release, the G release. So is that something that's going to continue in Grizzly? Yes, um, I think so. Uh, so there's various API refinements that, of course, we want to work on. And there's um, you know just improving the general uh, quality of how things are done that you always want to do in a software project. But what we're always also seeing is just a continual refinement of the sort of services that get integrated with outside of OpenStack. And so networking and storage are some of the large ones. And what we've seen is from the compute side, you know, there's Hyper-V support. VMware is talking about how they're going to be doing integration with uh, various VMware solutions. Um, we have KVM and uh, Zen, both XCP and server and um Zen.org, all done, and uh, and there's also work going on for OpenVZ, which is a container-like solution, as well as uh, LXC. Um, the container solutions are interesting in the sense that um, they they are needed for uh, hard, hardware appliances like um, like ARM that don't support hardware virtualization necessarily. Right. Um, having LXC or ARM, st- uh, sorry, or um, OpenVZ gives you uh, a way of doing containment and um, and multi tenancy um, with without having hardware virtualization. Gotcha. So I think that we'll just continue seeing this in Grizzly, and you know it's it's definitely a challenge when you have lots of different vendors coming in and having opinions about how things evolve. But it's one that we've been it's been the goal of the project since day one that we needed to OpenStack is more about how we put these pieces together and. And so figuring out the right interfaces internally and, you know, it looks messy from the outside, but that's because when you have hundreds of vendors, it is, can get a little messy, but I think the results have uh, been positive overall. Now, now one of the things is, you know, today, <clears throat> you know, you could, you could go out, um, you know, Folsom, you know, if you, if you talked about something like Folsom or Grizzly or any of the releases, they sort of, um, you associate them with all the projects, whether it's Nova or Glance or Swift or Cinder or whatever. Um, is that the plan going forward that, you know, you'll always sort of have, um, you know, you, if, if you were to pick up Grizzly or, or the L release or the whatever, that you, you'd pick up all the projects underneath it? Or do you ever see a time uh, when you'd go, well, um, I'll be running the G release, but I'll be running the, you know, two releases back of the network uh, you know the quantum code, or I mean, it, is do, do they all sort of have to stay in sync from like an API perspective, or or how do you see all these different projects kind of staying together, and, you know, and kind of keeping this six month cadence of releasing software? That's a great question. Um, I think that's one that as the project matures, we'll see um, a lot more of the sort of um, integrate uh, integration between the projects being about interfaces. Mm-hmm. For the most part, if if you if you're if you're spending a lot of time on how the integration works, um, you can do things like run a new version of this with an old version of that. And there are individuals who are doing that. Um, for the most part, supported companies, supported offerings are doing a all-in-one sort of thing. Um, but that said, uh, the work that's going in to the separation of volumes and networking um, is totally to support that goal of being able to upgrade things independently and have them be about the contracts between the interfaces, not having to uh, update each one at, at a time. Um, it, because of the fact that we are trying to live in the real world of supporting all these different uh, heterogeneous um, you know, backends right. to these components, um, we don't have the perfect interface to all of them right now. So 
um, if you if if you stop on one thing or one of your components right now, it may be such that it's harder to move forward. Um, but I think that to tie into this, that's why I think that it's important that OpenStack itself, the core OpenStack, me- maintains you know just being core infrastructure, and then we have this entire ecosystems of other projects that build on top using the versioned public APIs. Um, and you know a lot of people, you know, just to get into the API question, um, you know, there's a little bit of fud about OpenStack and EC2 and things like that. And we we had EC2 API support from day one because there's just such a huge ecosystem of tools and knowledge around that that community. Um, but we realized that the, those APIs don't really support the depth that you need when you start talking about a private cloud. So we have to actually support both of them. Um, so for instance, let's say you're wanting to run um, a database as a service on top of your infrastructure. You need to be able to make assertions about how close or how far those sort of resources need to be from each other. And that's just at a crude level. If you're really running this at a, um, there are people running, uh, like there's a, almost a thousand, I think it's 700 nodes uh, uh, with InfiniBand and w- almost one terabyte of RAM VMs that one, one of the early deployers of OpenStack is running in. And just the, the level of control that they need to be able to expose wasn't in the EC2 API, but they start with the EC2 API for the sort of tools they existingly have, and then they'll, as they need to start refining it and get getting those optimizations, they realize that they need another API. And so I don't think it's a choice of one versus another. It's that you have to have the interfaces that you need, and Amazon could be doing the best job ever with EC2. The, their use case thus far is the um, is the public API and, and that of a large, large enterprise uh, large, large deployment, not necessarily fitting for somebody who wants to deploy a rack or 10 racks. And so uh, I, I'm glad that we're um, able to support both. And I, I'm just, it's frustrating when people say that we're trying to force people to go to a new API. We're trying to allow the evolution of both. It's, gotcha. It, it, it's, it's interesting. It's maybe one of the first times I've ever sort of heard it, the, the, the OpenStack API discussed in a way that wasn't tried to be framed as, as sort of, well, it's competitive against EC2, or we're not going to let uh, EC2 dictate what our API looks like. I, I think that's the first time I've ever heard anybody who kind of could speak on behalf of OpenStack kind of say, look, uh, you know, we, we started with something. Um, there were certain reasons why we extended it or had to create some other stuff, and, you know, it, it was use case driven. So um, appreciate appreciate that, that openness. Um, so, you know, we, we've talked a bunch about OpenStack. We, we probably could you know, kind of go on in a bunch of different directions. Let's let's talk a little bit about what you're doing these days with Nebula. Um, you know, one of the first things that that always comes to mind um, when we when we start looking at Nebula and, and the company and so forth is, and I, I'd be curious if, how much you guys run into this. Um, Nebula is kind of a funny name in in today's marketplace because you have you know Nebula the company, which to a certain extent spun out of Nebula the NASA project. You've got companies like Nimbula, you've got Open Nebula as an open source project, <laughs> so it, it creates a little bit of confusion in the marketplace. But you know, for 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 what you guys are doing at Nebula, where's the company today? I mean, in terms of you know shipping a distribution, in terms of trying to differentiate, what's the what's the focus over at Nebula these days? Sure. Um, so our focus is building um, a computer. We're we're really a computer systems business. Um, mm-hmm. We're not a distro. We're not trying to. Uh, be something that you download and then uh, add to your existing systems. We're trying to solve it in a way that that's more uh, holistic. And um, just because anytime you go into the enterprise and you really start trying to deploy things and work with them, there's so many different teams that own different aspects. And so if you attack this as purely a you know a software or you know just one aspect of it you'll run into problems where it doesn't really scale. And so we've been working with some of the world's leading biotech, uh, financial services, and media companies um, and, and in, in pilot mode and getting great feedback. Um, you know, we work, obviously, with OpenStack, but we work with many open source projects uh, and, and that are integrated with our product and contribute back to all of them. We don't want to um, lead to a world where we're maintaining forks. Um, we, we, many of the people in the company have been around not only OpenStack since the beginning, but also open source for over a decade and, and 
just understand that you know any sort of thing that cause, causes a forking of what we're doing from what the community is doing as far as the um, core infrastructure uh, will cause massive amounts of pain to both us as well as potentially the community. Okay. And and when you talk about sort of as a as a as a system company and 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 looking to link these, is that trying to tie in some of the say big data Hadoop uh, types of projects or you know some of, some of the other larger open source things, or is it is it really looking at yourself as being kind of a, a leading um, you know, using open source as a foundation, but sort of systems integration type of technology or a type of company, I guess you know systems systems integrator. Um, I, I wouldn't classify it as a systems integrator. I would say that um, if you don't have a, a computer system approach, you have to then rely on system integrators. Okay. Um, a lot, a lot of the initial sort of de- large deployments of OpenStack have been done by people who have went in and uh, determined the exact requirements for the data center, for fault isolation zones as far as power goes. Um, for uh, how many uh, how many disks and what the topology is of all that, and that's something that works great if you are you know, like, uh, you know the Ebay's or the IBM's of the world. Uh, it doesn't necessarily work well when you're trying to build something on top of it that you really care about your platform. You don't and you but you want to use cloud uh, mechanisms and cloud technologies, and so we're trying to uh, we're working on providing that as. Uh, uh, you know, a solution that integrates with with the enterprise's offerings, um, but doesn't require them to be a- experts at be- deploying OpenStack or troubleshooting aspect that uh, OpenStack. They'll be users of OpenStack. Gotcha, gotcha. So, OpenStack being a framework, we will have a you know what our view of the uh, of a solution is, um, but in in a way that works with the entire ecosystem. Gotcha. So, so it ultimately is cool. about kind of kind of solving business problems. It just happens to be this technology that you guys have a background in that, that drives the core of a lot of what you're doing. That's correct. Um, okay. And we've been, you know, strong contributors to OpenStack. From, obviously, we have multiple of the project leads. And we work well, uh, and we also lead a project DevStack, which is, you know, even though we say OpenStack isn't a distribution, um, and there, there's no like real OpenStack you could download. That doesn't mean we don't have to know how to put it all together and uh, and do the continuous integration. And so we do a lot of work on how everything fits together, both from, you know, we have two people on the board, the foundation, we have multiple PTLs, and also in the testing and, uh, and the integration point of view uh, with all the different projects. Okay. Very cool. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things... That as a as a side conversation or sort of was getting some buzz at the OpenStack Summit was, you know, a lot of people were saying, look, uh, you'd go to the sessions, you learn some stuff, you come out of the sessions, and it was literally like a everybody's hiring, everybody's looking for people. Um, you know, you were with Anso Labs. I mean, you guys are obviously one of the you know basically one of the first groups that were that were bringing people together that were working on this. How how he, how much is the demand right now for people that have that have OpenStack skills? I mean, there's there was Anso. You you know a lot of you guys were, were maybe at Rackspace or, or at Nebula. You know, Mirantis is sort of doing some things. I mean, how how huge is that demand, or how how sort of robust is that demand right now for that that, that skill set? Well, I think there's a lot of demand for um, both uh, working on OpenStack in terms of there's a lot of different vendors building. Direct OpenStack solutions, but then there's there's that's almost like the tip of the iceberg. Um, a lot of the um, early deployments of OpenStack were people who were building com- differentiating products on top of OpenStack, and so they have taken to actually contributing to OpenStack because it, it allows them to optimize it for their use cases. Um, so you see a lot of people hiring both in non. Um, and non-vendor and people who aren't actually building OpenStack distros or appliances, you see them hiring people to work on the core project or to work on just integration where they add support for their you know, NetApp appliance or um, their their quantum uh, sorry their their, uh, their software defined networking solution. Hmm. Uh, so I see there there's a lot happening there. There's um, there's a lot of demand for sort of system integrators as well. People who could come in and put it together in ways that work for their uh, deployments and their systems, and telling them, uh, you know, 
how helping with not just it's not even really just purely open stack at that point it's how you design um, both applications and data centers to be more application failure domains instead of having to have servers and uh, and uh, VMs and whatnot that have to uh, maintain high availability at that level okay and and Jesse w- if you had any kind of advice for um, potential listeners out there who are, who are new to all of this and, and really want to kind of get started and get interested, what would be your recommendation for somebody new to OpenStack? Sure. Um, well, so the, the neat thing about OpenStack and, and actually probably all of the cloud platforms is that it does touch so many of these fundamental um, like basic compute storage <laughs> networking. Um, so if there's a specific area you're interested in, you could obviously look at the project and um, show up in the IRC channel or download DevStack or your favorite distro and just start poking at it. Um, but on top of OpenStack, I think there's been a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people are interested in, for instance, software-defined networking. And I think that that um, what we're seeing is, you, know, there's, you could just probably Google quantum space SDN and uh, OpenStack, and you'll see people blogging about how to create um, software SDN uh, labs just using a few servers and uh, with OpenStack on top of it. And so I think that you know, just my, my advice is always, wh- what are you personally passionate about? Um, and then finding ways to uh, um, you know, use that as your way to get into a project. Because, because there is so many different integration points with lots and lots of different um, you know, hypervisors and storage networks and storage systems and networks, you uh, might be overwhelmed when you just go in and start looking at the code and not realizing why everything's done how it is. So if you come in with a problem or um, a specific area that you're interested in and you know, hunting for that area and then working on that will probably be the best thing you could do. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask you one, one last question and, uh, and we'll sort of wrap it up. And again, uh, you know, thank you so much for your time tonight. So, you know, you, you mentioned there's, um, you know, there's a lot of companies involved with OpenStack. Um, there are some companies that are doing their own distributions. Um, and, you know, some of those are, uh, you know, just packaging, you know, ways to, to, to get the code out and deployed. Others include some of their own, um, you know, features that maybe have come back in the community or haven't come back. You know, some people may not necessarily understand all the interdependencies of OpenStack. They just sort of know, oh, okay, it's it's this thing that gets a lot of discussion. You know, as, as you're talking to as you're talking to, to customers, you're talking to businesses, whether you're doing it on behalf of of Nebula or as a, a board member, how, how do you try and explain some of that to people so they understand that there is this variety of things that that can solve problems for them? Maybe it's not always, you know, one thing. I mean, do, do you use the Linux analogy, or, or how do you explain the, the sort of variation that goes on within overall OpenStack to, to people that maybe don't live it and breathe it like you do? Sure, um, great question. Um, I think that it, it, it a lot depends upon how what level they're at, I and mean, if they're used to, if they know the difference that there are multiple distros of Linux, and you know that different. There's different ways to distribute it and different support mechanisms. And you know, are you paying for support? Are you paying for uh, certification? Um, or is it the fact that there's lots and lots of experts um, that get you know, training by a large company and there's integration with lots of solutions? Um, I, I usually um, start with the the fact that there are people running this on very very small like taking basically cell phone hardware and making clouds out of them. And then there are people taking and running VMs that have a full terabyte of RAM with the same software. And that OpenStack itself is, is meant to be a bunch of glue that presents that in a way that abstracts out the implementation. And so you could choose to back end it with hardware provider one, two, or three as far as all the different ones. And the SLA and the, you know, how how redundant and how resilient uh, the solution is has more to do with you know the, the costs and uh, of the you know is it is it better for us to do resiliency at the application level and not have very very expensive shared storage and to do live migration and and all that sort of um, jazz which is closer to like the virtualized data center or do you want to start with more of the cloud side, where uh, you know 
like the public clouds are doing, which is you have cheap VMs um, and and cheap storage, and then you know you, you solve those at the application layer. Um, so you know, I try to start there with that. There, there's this entire spectrum of virtualized data center to you know, greenfield cloud, and the different distros are choosing different different places to optimize for. And some of it may be support, some of it may be features and capabilities. Um, and but the goal is that we work together as a large community, such that an OpenStack cloud gives you a level of portability both from your existing uh, systems, if you use EC2, for instance, um, um, as well as uh, if you're moving from one OpenStack cloud to another, the goal is that you shouldn't have to know too much about the implementation. You can move from a Zen server cloud that has no shared storage to a um, sandbacked with KVM. Um, and from a user perspective, that's more of a cost benefit analysis uh, that, that the IT organization can do than the developer having to decide. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. Interesting cool. way of way of sort of explaining it. Well, listen, um, you know, Jesse. Again, thank you so much for the time tonight. Uh, you know, especially the you know just being as candid and transparent about all the things that have been going on with OpenStack. I know sometimes that you know what you what you see. Uh, you know, from various vendors or in the media sometimes isn't exactly what's really happening for the people that are down in the dirt, you know, trying to make these things happen. So thank you so much for your time. Um, Aaron, you want to sort of wrap us up and take us home? Yeah, absolutely. So we are out of time for this week. Jesse, where can everyone either follow you or find out more about what is going on with OpenStack Technology, Nebula, or the OpenStack Foundation? Um, sure. OpenStack itself uh, is OpenStack.org uh, and um, at, at OpenStack on Twitter, all the various places. Um, Nebula, of course, is nebula.com and you, know, you can follow us there and also on uh, Twitter. Um, and myself, I'm Jesse, but I was way too late to join Twitter, so I am another Jesse on Twitter. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Um, so thank you very much. If you like the show, please tell a friend or leave us a review on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at the Cloudcast Net or on the web at thecloudcast.net where you can find links to everything Cloudcast. Thanks for listening. 